Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle, and I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Nature of Aesthetics. These books are free for viewing online at www.philosophypublishing.com. They are also available free upon request as a, uh, an attachment in an email, and the email is at the website. Along with me are the uh, panelists. We have Dr. Mark Brennan, professor at the Stern School of Business in New York University. He is also the American editor of the Quarterly Review of London, established 1809. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Chris. Along with us is Rick Samuelson. Rick graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton, an MA from Tufts, and is a retired investment banker, and currently is in an independent venture capitalist. Welcome, Rick. The, the purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts being used in current media and compare the essence of the concept with the usage and circumstances in which the term is being used. This week, we're going to discuss the, the IRS and its, its latest actions against the conservative groups uh, that's currently in the news. I'd kind of like to uh, think of this as a, a new reign of terror. Uh, of course, when we think of the expression reign of terror, we, we think back to uh, the times of Stalin. Um, and I've read some tracks with that, that title in it uh, regarding those ages, but this is almost of the same ilk. So we're going to, it's a pretty important discussion. So let's start. Lately, the IRS has been, uh, has admitted to having policy differences with the conservative and, and uh, Republican groups, and thus has uh, admitted to delaying and denying conservative applications back to uh, pre-election days of 2012. And because of that, uh, they may have influenced the uh, election. Their action was uh, to delay and deny uh, up to uh, 500 conservative organizations that wanted to participate uh, in the election and uh, post-election uh, matters. So this policy of the IRS, where did it come from? Obviously, somebody has to uh, indicate a policy uh, inside the IRS, and that can be internal or external. That, that policy. It can develop either way. So what is the probability, because actually the IRS uh, 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 agents or management that has been interviewed have not really admitted much, but what's the probability of uh, just randomly selecting uh, all these 500 groups and having uh, no uh, denial or delays of liberal and democratic groups? occurring. So I kind of dusted off my, uh, my math memory and uh, probability. So let's just, uh, what is the probability of that happening? Randomly choosing 500 organizations, all of them being conservative or part of the one, one type of uh, group. Well, Obviously, it's uh, one action outcome, that is, you either delay or deny, and there's two choices, a Democrat or a conservative or Republican group. So if you just take one of them, it's obviously a 50% chance that it will be one of the two groups, so 50%. But then, if you do that time and time again, it's one out of two, but you're 
to figure out the uh, probability, you would multiply them. One, one half by one half by one half, up to 500 times. What an, infin an infinitely small number that is. One out of uh, over 500, or one over two to the 500th power, woof. Well, you say, well, it doesn't happen like that. It's more like a bowl. Well, if you take a bowl and uh, you pick one of the, uh, one color is blue and the other one's red, and you pick out one, and uh, <coughs> well, then you could have picked out a blue or a red, and if, let's, say, let's say there are 500 in there. So in 500 in there, and there's 250 of one color, 250 of the other color. So any chance of it becoming uh, one group as opposed to the other is 250 divided by 500, or 50 percent, same as it is here, one out of two. But then after you take that out, you probably have one left. So then the next time you put your hand in there, you got 249 uh, over uh, uh, 499. And then goes right down the, the line. The next time you put your hand in there and take one out, it's 248 out of two, uh, 498. So the percentage of 248 over 499 is just slightly less than 50%. And 248 over 198, just slightly less than 50%, but decreasing each time. Well, if you add those percentages up, for example, 50% times just slightly less than 50%, you get approximately one quarter of a percent, approximately what it is here, but slightly less because you're taking one out. Again, a huge number. So anybody bringing that point up obviously has no credence at all. The, the probability of it happening all to 500 groups and zero to the Democrats is an is incredibly small number, small probability. So, next, obviously the IRS was influenced in some way or another. And that could have been an internal policy decision, or it could have been coming uh, externally. It could have come from a political policy from the U.S. Treasury, because the IRS is within the U.S. Treasury. And, of course, the, the U.S. Treasury is within the executive branch, specifically under the White House, under the President. And the President, of course, has an ideology. And it seems that ideology is toward the big brother, big government. And the conservative groups were specifically against larger government and were fighting for a smaller government as the Tea Party started to evolve uh, from uh, 2010. So, but if it's an internal policy creation, you have kind of an internal conspiracy, a group of IRS management get together we're going to do this, uh, we're going to create this policy, and we're going to go against uh, conservative groups. And so these management, internal management of the IRS must be left-wing leaning, or Democrats, or liberal Democrats. And so you would say that there's a left-wing conspiracy inside the IRS, within the executive branch. Well, conspiracies are, are not well believed, and the probability of such a thing is, well, we probably would call it preposterous. And so this thought is almost not an option. But this is a possibility. So the likelihood of an internal conspiracy happening? Well, not likely. Further to that, if there were an internal conspiracy creating a policy, that means there's no oversight within the IRS 
by the IRS uh, executives, officers, and management, and, the, uh, and over them, the, uh, the IRS commissioner. But that's not likely in a government because there's always many layers of management. And, uh, and also, coming from, this, uh, from the government were complaints because once the delays and denials started, these complained to their representatives, their representatives in the government complained to the IRS. So there was some cognizance of complaints going on, and if they are at all a manager, they would have looked into it. So with that said, with that introduction, let's go to our panel and uh, further this conversation. How now, this problem of the IRS, guys? What do you think? Well, Professor, since, um, Professor Brennan, since I haven't seen you in such a long time, why don't we start with you? Uh, I've always been a fan of uh, when people get upset at the IRS and uh, they completely forget the, the, the old adage, it's the message, not the messenger. The IRS is just the enforcement mechanism for the evil state that designs on all of our network and money. The blame thing on the IRS when they've been empowered by your elected representative is to really uh, shoot at the wrong person. And, you know, the, the, our six million word our tax code, million word tax which when you have a six million word tax code, uh, you effectively don't have a tax code, it's whatever your lawyer can make of it. Uh, that was not dreamed up by the IRS. That was dreamed up by the guy that you put in office. So this all, they're the middleman who's being caught here, but the real villains in this are the people who have empowered the IRS and have such authority and this ridiculous code that can be wielded against anybody for any reason. Yeah. Um, Rick, any comments? Uh, opening comments? Well, as I follow the, the latest press reports on this, it seems uh, on the conservative side, there's a, a view being put forward now that even if this policy wasn't directed from the White House, basically the, the tone that the White House set made this type of outrageous investigation of conservative groups uh, seem acceptable uh, within the norms of the current administration. Um, I'm a bit more cynical than that. I, I, I can't believe that the IRS on its own would undertake a policy that is so egregious toward a particular group or set of groups. Uh, so I suspect that, you know, there's been a, a lot of nodding and winking behind the scenes. And that may, that information may not easily come out because, you know, you've got a White House run by lawyers and they, they take all the usual precautions and are quite careful about uh, which conversations are recorded and which are not, and which emails get sent and which do not. Uh, so. I suspect we are in, and, and given how the IRS representatives themselves are very obviously evasive, based on what I saw with uh, Mr. Wright in his uh, testimony before Congress, I think it's going to take quite some months to even begin to uncover the full dimension of this. Certainly, uh, the hearings will certainly drag on if the uh, if the uh, if they pursue it uh, extensively. You know, the IRS is now going to control Obamacare. And can you imagine if they could do what we've just discussed uh, and extrapolate that to your health? In other words, let's say uh, you're a, a right-leaning uh, in your ideology and you decide that uh, your doctor decides that you need uh, an operation or some medicine. It, uh, along the same lines that have j just occurred here, they might withhold or with delay or deny uh, those medical benefits if you're within the, the grasp of the Obamacare. 
and and therefore I when I opened the show I I turned or or remembered the uh, the phrase reign of terror could we actually use this term this phrase within uh, this framework here today in the problem of the IRS mark you were using reign of terror from the Russian revolution weren't you Yes, that's where I originally read uh, read the uh, that phrase. It, it actually comes from the French Revolution. It predates the uh, Russian Revolution by uh, 120 years. Uh -huh. uh, we've been living under a reign of terror basically since uh, the, the reign of Abraham Lincoln. The last 150 years have been a reign of terror from our federal government. I would just like to thank uh, uh, the Republicans for putting up no fight against Obamacare, for pushing through Schedule D and all that stuff where conservatives like me and uh, like you at heart at least uh, have gotten have no recourse and we take it on the chin and this reign of terror really uh, is not accelerated in any way. It's just which partisan group you're willing to blame for what's going on. And I blame pretty much every partisan group since Abraham Lincoln in this country. Yeah, now that you mentioned, I, I, I remember the uh, slogan reign of terror from the French Revolution actually. Um, but it's still alive. Uh, but <laughs> obviously, it's still alive. I mean, we, we have, you know, we, we, we're, we're especially, you know, the Jacobins were the ones who pursued it. We are especially Jacobin in our foreign policy. This global revolution, kill people who don't believe in our system. That's where we, that's where you really, really see the American arena terror is in, is in the foreign context. Uh, Rick, what do you think of that phrase, reign of terror, applying it to, and, and applying it to uh, this current IRS situation? Well, um, as much as I'd like to compare, uh, particularly uh, the Attorney General to uh, Rose Peter, uh, I do think, you know, the, at best, it's a, a reputational reign of terror. Um, the kind of uh, you know, torture and uh, so forth that, that occurred in the French Revolution doesn't appear to be on the immediate horizon. Um, could be in the not too distant horizon, but doesn't appear to be on the immediate horizon. I think it's it's it, it's more Orwellian than 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 a, a reign of terror. I think. The, the administration, it appears, through a, new, uh, a number of mechanisms, seems to want to stifle opposition to the extent it can within the confines of what is at least technically legal. That seems to be what's going on here, uh -huh. uh, to my way of thinking. Uh, and I suspect that in, in, in the the struggle that will occur over the, uh, the coming months in terms of the Republicans trying to extract information from the administration of what actually happened and who was responsible, and the willingness of the administration to throw this or that official under the bus to satisfy, you know, a craving for uh, revenge on the Republican side. We'll see how far this thing goes, and uh, I'm not sure it'll ever be resolved. Let's move to a, an important question that's not yet being discussed. How do we rectify this situation so that what I like to call the reign of terror, the new reign of terror of the IRS, how are we going to prevent something like this, this kind of abuse uh, in the future, uh, Professor, do you have any uh, do you have any thoughts on the uh, on how to rectify this? Sure. Uh, one of the most important things that Hannah Arendt said in her book on totalitarianism is that you cannot have a totalitarian regime, uh, or in order to have a totalitarian regime, there's one precondition that must be met, and that is the existence of a secret police force. And that's essentially kind of what you're getting at here. If the IRS is acting as like our Stasi or our NKVD or our KGB or whatever, whichever group you want to look back in history and, and, and refer to, the IRS is taking that role. And you know, 
as of now, it's only talking about how your tax, how you, you know, you, how you're do, th filing your taxes. But as you pointed out, with Obamacare, it's going to be involved in other things. But with the in inexorable growth of our federal government, it's going to be involved in more and more, and it will evolve into the United States Stasi. So the totalitarian takeover, uh, you can see this kind of happening as it occurs. And you know, to say this is crackpot thought, this is exactly what Hannah Arendt, how she described the evolution of totalitarian regimes. Well, that's an interesting point, uh, that the IRS is taking the actual function of secret police and, uh, that have been present throughout history. And we have other things. We're just not consolidating. We have the TSA, we have Homeland Security, we have you know, all these things. We have the Patriot Act, which empowers all these guys. So we, you know, we will have our secret police where you will be anonymously denounced. You'll go through a Kafka S trial to build on Rick's literary metaphors. Uh, but you know, it's, or it's Orwellian. It's also uh, Brave New Worldish from Aldous Huxley. It's, it's, you know, we're being bombarded with so much crap everywhere. You can't tell what's true and what's not. And the average American is more concerned about how Ali Raisman did last night on Dancing with the Stars and doesn't care about any of this stuff. The slow si slide into stupidity is here. Mm-hmm. So, Rick, how would you rectify the uh, the situation? Is it possible to, uh, well, uh, to take, take the sting a, out of the yeah, IRS? I think Mark touched on something extremely important there. Uh, I, I think um, the average working person has lost connection with the democratic process, and I'm as guilty of it as anybody else. Um, because for years and years and years there was a, a general confidence that the system was more or less fair. But if that is no longer true, and this latest scandal po certainly points to that, then unless the average person chooses to engage in the democratic process, and that may mean protesting, that may mean at some point, uh, overthrowing the government, I mean, if Jefferson would have recommended that, um, nothing's going to change. You can't expect the government to fix this. Good point, good point. And so uh, we should look the other way, obviously, to fix the IRS. I know that, or I'm certain that, at least one of the two sides out there in Congress will say, well, we'll put another oversight committee over the IRS so that this doesn't happen again. But the problem with that is that that oversight committee can be corrupted just as the IRS uh, has been corrupted. So really, you have to go to the other direction internally. What's the best way? I would feel that the best way would be to simplify the tax code so that uh, the IRS has no uh, so much uh, discretion uh, within their decision-making uh, process, including whether it's profit, for-profit, or non-profit organizations. Obviously, they can corrupt. So in order to, they can be corrupted. So in order to prevent that, we must go the other way. Instead of oversight, we must defund it or take its power out by making the tax code simpler. A flat tax. A flat tax would be one good, uh, one good um, example. Uh, no, so the best thing you want to do is simplify the tax code. Uh, I, I, I think I know what you're getting at. Uh, you don't want to simplify what we have. You want to just eradicate what we have, start from scratch, clean slate. Uh, because as soon as you start simplifying what's there, you get vested interests who have fought long and hard to get the benefits they get out of the tax code to fight to keep their little tricks in. So you, this must be abolished from the get-go. You know, it was foisted upon us. It was a foist upon us in 1913. We can very easily be foisted from ourselves, and we should. But we're not. We're not going to have the luxury of doing that because the global bond markets are, are going to uh, force change upon us, whether we like it or not. That day is coming, and when it does, it's going to be hideous, and all these things are going to change. What about, uh, well, uh, yes, you mentioned eradicating. Okay, how does the government obtain revenue while obliterating or eliminating the IRS? 
What we used to do through tariffs. We go back to a tariff system to start. We can tariffs, you mean like on imported goods? Yeah. Or a national sales tax, possibly? Maybe. Okay. Rick, suggestions? Well, I, I mean, if you're speaking of eliminating the uh, federal income tax, I'm all in favor uh, and uh, relying on a system of tariffs. Uh, that would be wonderful as far as I'm concerned. The need that's to... That's how we funded it until 1913. Oh, that's right, yes. The need to, uh, to depower the IRS. Is it uh, an absolute necessity going forward to be able to retain our liberties? Professor, you first. Just two minutes left. It's, again, it's not the IRS. The IRS is just the mechanism by which the federal government extracts all wealth. Here's, here, here's, here's a better thing we can do. We don't, have to, we don't have to change the tax code. We just change the withholding mechanism. So instead of you having money taken out of every one of your paychecks, you get the gross amount of your paycheck on April 15th. You've got a check to the federal government, which is the way we did it in this country until 1941. Chris, if we reinstituted that system, there would be a civil war on April 16th because people would be cutting checks and saying, what am I cutting a $55,000 check for? What am I getting in return for this? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing drone attacks on Afghanistan. I'm, we're sending money to rebuild all these countries, and I'm watching tornadoes blow down people in Oklahoma, and my money's not going there. There would be a civil war the next day. The slow bleed of the, of the withholding mechanism, people don't notice it. Oh, you know, I just look at the net amount of my paycheck. Give people the gross amount of their paycheck, and let them cut up the check on April 15th. It would all, the party would end on a dime. Rick, final thoughts. I, I wholeheartedly... Um, endorse that message. Okay. Yes, it, eliminate the withholding. It, 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 you know, we, we have lapsed into uh, an atrophied state because we just take all this for granted and we don't pay attention to where the money is going and why. Chris, okay. simple test. Simple test. Ask anybody, what is the net amount of your paycheck that comes every two weeks? People can tell you to the penny what it is. Then ask them, what's the gross amount? And they can't come within. $300 to tell you what the gross amount of their paycheck is. Okay. That's all their money. Great points, guys. And I want to thank you for being here. And thanks, uh, thank you, everybody, for joining the Philosophical Angle. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.